for the invitation mm -hmm. and uh, Professor Safwe as well uh, for this opportunity. And uh, first of all, I surrender the technologically. I'm very challenged. So, and uh, I'm really a chalk duster guy, but we'll try our best. Uh, to give you the chalk duster uh, impression, I have done some handwritten slides. At least this way you will figure the bad handwriting over the blackboard. But the good thing, or I'll try my best to explain the things properly. Okay. As uh, Jugal Professor Harma, as well as Professor Umar pointed out, you must ask questions and, uh, and uh, clear your doubt, no matter even if it is a stupid question. Okay, please go ahead. And since this is the first lecture of this program, I like to give you a smooth start rather. So I'll go a bit slowly. <coughs> and <clears throat> give you a lot of room to catch up a few things, uh, even if, if it is not directly related with the major theory, whatever you will see. So it's about uh, integration, uh, the course is more or less. So I'll, I'll start with a very brief history of integration. So um, you can go back to Archimedes. When he says someone did this, it doesn't mean that uh, the Archimedes did all of it. He had some impression from other mathematician before, his time, okay? But Archimedes is the person who computed, uh, so look at the timeline, uh, it's BC 288 to 12. So he computed the area of the parabolic segment. So this is a kind of parabola. As I told you, my handwriting is not good. <clears throat> so you get a parabola and bound it over this, uh, you know, particle lines and you ask, what is the area of this? Of course, we know how to do this in our days, but talking about BC. So he was able to compute these. Uh, he also computed area and circumference of circle. So, okay. Uh, so I think Galileo said uh, he, uh, Archimedes is a superhuman, okay, as far as scientific contribution is concerned. After this, then he asked the fundamental question in those days, what is the area of this, of this area, this segment, what is the segment? It is the same, but instead of the parabola, you take a continuous function. And that was his question. So you know, when we solve one question, then we eat another one pops up, right? That's the one. And uh, we're talking about BC, okay? Uh, before Christ. So this was the question. And look at the gap. It took from this BC to the Newton's era. I think Newton did in, I forgot, uh, mid of, you know, six, during the, I think during the pandemic. So it would be 1650, uh, sorry, 1670 or something like that. So he computed, he answered the question of Archimedes and he came up with, uh, with precise uh, formula, etc. And the formula or the methodology is what we know as our school integration. So what you have learned in our school is actually the Newton integration, okay. And um, he, he wanted this for his uh, law of motion, okay? So he had to have this answer. And so he came up with this uh, during this time. Now, school integration, as I said, it, it's our school integration, but there were some troubles, okay? There are some trouble in the Newton integration. First of all, it, it is not rigorous. Rather, it was not rigorous. Why? Uh, uh, because the limit, so you have seen the limit concept in the integration, even uh, in school, right? So the limit was not introduced uh, in, it was not known in Newton's time. It was introduced by Bolzano in 1817, much later of Newton, okay? So it was not quite rigorous or even still it is not rigorous, I would say. Second point, which is, uh, which is also very remarkable, that Fourier was coming up with the revolutionary Fourier series concept. So what you know as Fourier series, he was, he was bringing up that, uh, you know, he was surfacing up and integration of discontinuous function, uh, discontinuous, but not too very discontinuous. Remember that Newton was interested in continuity, right? Was very much needed for Fourier series. So Fourier wanted to have integration, which can take care of some discontinuity. I said, not too many. Now you can ask, what is the, what is, what is the meaning of not too many? I'll not talk about that. We'll figure this out over this course. 
So let's keep it in the quotation. And uh, this can't be avoided because uh, what Fourier was coming up uh, today, what we see as telecommunication, what else? It was the beginning. So you can understand that uh, technology, science, everything was going together during those days. So Newton was not enough for Fourier or the related theory. Okay, that time after. Around 1854, Bernard Riemann came up with his Riemann integration theory, which we can consider as a rigorous integration. So that you might have learned. And we'll also talk about this occasionally. So what is Riemann integration? Now, I've been asked to follow Rudy, and we'll talk about Rudy. And uh, it's a really great pleasure and uh, fun to follow Rudy. And you will also see, Rudy is really still the best book in my opinion, okay? So I quoted from Rudy, and you see how remarkably he, he, he presented this. So roughly, and as I said, following Rudy, you will find this in page one of first chapter, okay? He said, Riemann integral of a bounded, I, this I have added, I think he, he meant it, but anyway, function f over a closed interval a, b can be approximated by sums of the form sum of f x i, times MEI, where MEI is length of EI. EI is what? EI is an interval. It's, it gets from the partition of the interval AB. So what you do, you look at AB and you get a partition of the interval AB and partition by inter, sub-intervals and EIs are all the sub-intervals, okay? Once you talk about sub-interval, you can talk about the length of the of those subintervals. So MEI is the length of the, of the interval EI or subinterval EI. And you take XI from, uh, from the subinterval EI. So the idea is clear. What he is saying? So, okay, look at, uh, look at this guy, your Y equals to FX bounded. You, you may have some discontent, I'm not considering right here. So this is AB and you divide this, you get partition, doesn't have to be equidistance, which was also the idea, which was the idea for Newton, right? You remember one over in inter, sub, uh, length of sub, length of in sub intervals of length one over in was the point for Newton. Anyway, so you do that, you pick a you pick a point from there, let's say x1, let's say x2, and so on, and you look at this. Well, there are there are stories. You have to look at uh, your soup or inf and so on. So you have to look at lower sum, you have to look at upper sum, all that. But altogether, it's precise thing is that you are essentially approximating the meaning of integration by some of this kind. I'm not going to the detail, neither Rudin did, but it's nicely done. Do you have any question on this quotation? Uh, so the function here is not necessarily continuous, right? No, 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 it's bounded, that's the point. So when you move from your school integration, not only your, our school integration, okay, I also learned, and still school, school students are learning. When you move from Newton to Riemann, you drop the assumption of you know, continuity, et cetera. And as I told you, the historical aspect, there was a need. See, whenever you come up with something, there is always, there will be always some need. There was some need, and the need was, mark my word, it's full years. Okay, and as you said, I also pointed out, it doesn't have to be uh, continuous, but bounded is needed because if you recall, you want to talk about uh, supremum of the function over sub-interval, infimum of the function of the sub-interval, right? Remember that? So bounded, is, yes, sir. Yes, sir. bounded yes, sir. is all you need, continuity, no. But later on, you realized through your harder theory, etc., this function cannot have too many discontinuities. But it can afford a couple of discontinuity. Couple means what? We'll talk about it in this course. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Any other question? Okay. All right. So, Mark, uh, so keep this in mind this comment from Rudin. And often I'll, I'll just quote from Rudin because I really love it. And I am thankful to, uh, to you guys because for you guys, I am again back to Rudin and I really love it. Love it, okay? 
Okay, so Riemann integration is pretty much this. I just draw this bad picture, but let it be there because I have to say something which is part of philosophical again. A trouble again, so it's not perfect. Okay, the trouble is the following. This idea of Riemann integration doesn't go well with limit of function. That means you want to integrate a sequence, if any, and then take the limit. Or you take the limit first and then you integrate. And you ask, is it going to be equal? For instance, you take sequence of polynomials. Let's say the simple one. Suppose fn equals to x power n, okay? And certain over certain interval, you integrate x power n and your value will depend on it, sure, right? Let's say zero to one, simple case. Zero to one x power n, you integrate your, uh, Oh, yeah, your answer will depend on it. And then you take the limit. Then you will change your mind. Okay, I look at the I look at the x power n that limit first over 0 to 1. And then I integrate from 0 to 1. Is this two is going to be equal? Not talk about answer. It's a little homework, whether it does or not. Then you replace x power n by let's say these are polynomials. And then you do some limit argument again and you go other way, you ask this and you move on. And then there is something called power series or uh, you know, Taylor's expansion, et cetera. You want to play with this game because often, you know what, uh, I, I'll come to that. If you ask an example of functions, okay? So suppose I ask you, uh, what is an example of function? Can you kind of give me an example of Let's say simple example. Simplest maybe? Uh, fx equal to x square. Oh, okay. Let me try to note this down. That's the okay, right here. So you said fx equals to x square. So f will be my function, and I'm saying this is x square, right? Okay. Is there any simpler than that? Anyone simpler than that? Constant. Constant. Oh, wow. fantastic. So constant c. Anything after constant, anything in between c and x square? Fx is equal to x. Yes. No, x, okay, go on. So you might want to say x power n, fantastic. Uh, can I say, then I take the sum of all these guys, can I say is polynomial is a good answer? Right? Yeah. By the way, why you are saying these are good? Do you know the answer? Why we are saying these are good? Why they are good? Uh, they are continuous and differentiable. Continuous and differentiable, is it that? Is, is there any other reason? Let's say I don't know continuous. I don't know what is the differentiable. Is there any other reason? Uh, because it is easy to divide them into divide the uh, divide them into small intervals and calculate the area under the curve. Oh, that's a very brilliant answer. So you said uh, we can compute the area under this curve, is it? Yes, like we can. Um, Calculate the area under the curve easily when compared to some other complex functions like polynomial functions. Are no, I'm not in complex, I'm in real. Let's say, real. yeah, you are right. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I mean, uh, some functions uh, more complex, like, uh, more uh, complex. Yeah, functions which are more complex. Ah, uh, polynomial functions are very simple uh, when we uh, go for calculating the area under yeah. the curve by dividing into a small interval. That's a good answer. But can you make your answer a little simpler? That would freeze the issue. You are almost close. You, you said that you can easily compute the area, right? Right? Graph of this function can be drawn easily. Drawn easily. That's also a very good answer. Can I say, can I say, actually, I appreciate the answer. You, you are, all of your answers are right. But can I say, you can actually evaluate the value of Fa easily? Because you can evaluate, so you can compute the area, you can do you know, whatever you say. Is it, won't it be a bad answer then? Won't it be a good answer then, if I say that? You agree? You see, if you give me fx square, I can tell you what is f2, right? I can tell you what is f2.5. Is it not, right? Right? So it's coming down computation. So give me a value, you can do it very quickly. But now after px, what would be, a, what would be an example of a function after polynomial? 
exponential function p uh, e power x exponential man you brought it so fast <laughs> okay we'll talk about this hold this one okay so what is the best example let's say you can talk about after p x polynomial okay you said exponential will come get back fine fine but when you talk so coming back to this issue and i again come back to this remind me if i forget bring you back. Uh, so this exchange of limit uh, under the integration, etc., is very vital. Why? I give you one sentence answer. Is the following. So you, you want to figure out a function. You cannot perhaps, because just some a minute back you said functions need not look like all this polynomial monomial. What you want to do, sometimes you want to approximate a bad guy or bad function or an unknown function through polynomial, sequence of polynomials. Does it make sense? So, for instance, you might want to say, uh, I do not know if man, but you know what? I can say fx equals to limit of pnx, where pn is a sequence of, you know, it's a polynomial. Then will it be a bad deal? Because then you maybe you can say fx, you know, f2 equals to limit of pn2 and pn2 you can compute, maybe you can say f2. Do you get my point? Right? And once you get that, then some of you already said that you want to know easy to integrate, etc. Maybe integration of p and x is easier than integration of fx. Right? You are getting what uh, what where you are trying to converge, right? So do you see that we really want to? It's our job to figure this out, so this limit, and all these. You see that, right? So Riemann integration isn't that good doing that kind of job. That's strike one. Second strike, too many discontinuity. As I said, I'm not explaining the meaning of too many. Is it five discontinuity, 10 discontinuity, million, million, countable, finite? I'm not talking about it. We'll talk about this. But too many discontinuity, is, it doesn't work well, right? And third, unbounded function is just you said, right? It's, it's bounded. Unbounded functions are not integrable. Okay, yes, we can, it makes sense, but sometimes, you know, even a function is unbounded, but still it gives you some finite area. And Riemann integration means that part. So it's unbounded, you just forget it. You don't bring it into the picture at all. That's not good, okay? So sometimes unbounded function also gives you some area. You, I hope you are aware of this, right? So even the area makes sense sometimes. It doesn't just work in that way. So there are too many issues with Riemann integration. And from 1854, just after 50 years, Lebesgue came up, which is the focus of this course. Finally, Lebesgue came up, came up in 1904. And here is something I want to tell you roughly, unofficial. Okay, even these are recorded and we will be quoting, etc. But these are all. Let's say these are all, uh, you know, we are inside of in a class and we're talking, okay? Roughly, he did it very uh, revolutionary. It's my understanding. And if I'm wrong, I'll correct. And if I, if you find myself and me as a making this wrong, let me know, I'll fix this in the future, okay? Even if I don't, uh, after six days, someone will come. Even during that time, if you find it's wrong, we'll fix it up, okay? So roughly, he went on the other way. That's, I, I think, okay, it's very different. And that's where the idea comes from. So he went other way around in the sense, so you have a function f from a, b to range of, you know, f of a, b to range of f, I mean, where it could go. So you are a, b to r function, instead of the range r, you focus on the range of it. And he, as I said, he went ultra thing in the following sense. Instead of dividing the domain AB, remember we were dividing the domain here? Riemann did it, uh, Newton also did it, right? So instead of doing that, he did other way around. So what he did, he looked at the range of it. Let's say this is alpha beta, and he divide the alpha beta in, the, uh, he, he get a partition of the range of f, which is alpha beta, let's say, and he partitioned that one. And then he did what? He looked at the inverse of f of ei. So he looked at the range. Range will be in the y-axis, right? In the y-axis, he got a partition, took a partition, and then he pulled back all, all, all of those subintervals to the x-axis back. 
Okay. And in this case, instead of fxi mei sum it up, he did what? He took yi from fi, fi is a pullback uh, in the x axis. He took yi from f and consider, let's not call it length, let's call the measure of fi. The fi is what? The inverse image of f of, f, of ei. And he considered the, let's call for a moment, let's call the length. And then he took the sum, and that's what he approximate and what he called is the integration, rigorous integration, and what he calls a level equation. Do you see the difference? You see the difference, right? I mean, this very unofficial statement. So fxi mei get replaced by yi times m of fi is fi. Yeah, fi, what is fi? fi is the inverse image of uh, ei. What is ei? Yeah, is a sub interval of the of the uh, partition of the range space, right? Now you strike very quickly. Wow, you are talking about f i as f inverse of e i. I understand e i is an interval, but what is the guarantee of f inverse of e i will be an interval? You understand what I'm saying? So f inverse of e i, come on, I mean it's not going to be interval in general. In fact, occasionally it will be interval. Right? So you look at a function and you quickly figure out it's not going to be interval. So this length, what I said, is, is false. The length is not a right word. The right word would be some sort of length, of course, but not uh, that length, what you understand as a length of interval. It's not going to be interval. So it is some kind of a measure, which is very close to the length, the notion of length, right? And you have to make sense of m of if f i. What is fi? Inverse image of intervals. That means you have to talk about the notion of length or measure for a large class of set. Because when you talk about mfi, this fi will be lots of lots of sets, subsets of r, and quite far from standard notion of intervals, right? So we need to talk about the measure of subsets of r, or rn, or even abstract set, right? And if we can talk about, if we can make sense of this well, then we can talk about this well, and then you can talk about the Levig integration, and that's the goal of this course. You have any question? If you have a bit of Levig measure, maybe you will agree, right? You have any question? And can you read my handwriting? Well, I'm, 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 I'm reading, but I hope it's not too bad, right? I mean, at least you can read. Um, yes, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I know it's not great. It's not coming from your heart, but <laughs> all right. Uh, so we need to talk about measure uh, of a number of sets and then talk about the above estimate. We want to talk about this. This is all about level measure, right? And since I'm talking about, uh, you know, I started with uh, Archimedes, uh, maybe I, I give a very, very quick, very, very rough idea about calculus. It's clear, right? We are doing calculus, right? So calculus, now you see why I'm afraid of doing this, uh, you know, live writing, because it's even much worse. Anyway, so calculus, if you think, uh, you can divide, if you look, if you remember your uh, undergrad or even whatever you are doing. So there are two types, right? One is the derivative, another is integration, right? Correct? Would it be right if I say that differentiation makes a function rougher? Rougher means what? I mean rough. So in other words, a function is differentiable, but the derivative, when you look at it, the function may not be even continuous. Is it familiar to you, right? So you take a continuous function and with the function you do look at, sorry, you, you look at a differentiable function, you differentiate the new guy, whatever you get, is need not be even continuous. It can happen. So that's the meaning I said, derivative make function rough. You know, it's not, doesn't make, you know, it doesn't give you a better one. Okay, so it's, it's a rough, it's a rough method. So it's one hand. On the other hand, integration goes completely other way around. 
right? You remember, so if you start with the integrable function, you, the integration will be continuous. If you start with the continuous function and integrate, you get a differential function. So the status gets improved. Do you agree? So DDX is in one hand, integration is in other hand, the very different nature. The idea of differentiability, if you trace the definition, it's like uh, the principle that is cut into small pieces, or you know, let's take it in the microscopic level and find out how it changes. That's all about differentiation, right? So you look at small, you know, rate of changes. So you do the you know very, very small piece and go to the microscopic level and you see the nature of function. Someone of you said, uh, how, if you like, if you write y equals to fx, how to realize, how to feel, you know, polynomial is better, but you know, monomial is better, but how do I do that? We we'll talk about maximum, minima, this, that, whatnot, first derivative test, second derivative test to figure out, right? Whereas in the integration, it's other way around. So integration, it's a, you join the small pieces together to find out how much uh, is there, like area, like volume, right? So differentiation, one extreme, integration is other extreme, right? But do they match up? These two extreme match up? So I'm talking about kind of diagram. So you take function, set of function, differentiate, you get something, you, you integrate, you get something, and these two gets match up what's, what is known as fundamental theorem of calculus. Do you, do you remember, do you buy this? Can you tell me what is fundamental theorem of calculus by now? Can you tell me this? Any one of you? Oh, if a function is continuous on a closed okay. interval. Let's say A to B, what, what do you want to say? If prime. Yeah. Function, okay. Yeah. If prime. Then, uh, then the integration can be uh, calculated only on the endpoints and that will give a special. The minus, minus a. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Can you tell me what is so cool about this formula? Uh, uh, we just need to know the value at endpoints. Wonderful. Uh, but also, do you see that this is the march of derivative and integration? Right? Yeah. Right? So now you see the what I was trying to tell you. Right? And second thing, as you said, that look at your left hand side. Left hand side is what? Left hand side is the integration over something, right? Over an interval AB, right? And the right hand side is what? Right hand side says, forget about A to B. Instead, look at your F on the boundary of AB. What is the boundary of AB? is just a comma b, right? This is all it says. This is very fabulous. And this is, uh, if you think a little bit carefully, if you know Stokes theorem or anything, that's what exactly talked about. It's like uh, reducing the dimension, right? So I believe you're going to, you. I, I do not know. I mean, it's a short course, right? So uh, it doesn't matter, but you are going to face this again and again uh, in your course. It will not be this course, but your scientific career, okay? Any question on this calculus, the meaning of derivative, the meaning of integration, and then matching these two things through fundamental theory of calculus. So you're going to do this uh, as a homework to realize what I'm trying to say. And let me know if you disagree. If you agree, it's fine. But if you disagree, let me know. All right. So this is uh, pretty much, uh, I spent 30 minutes to tell you the history I do not know, it is perhaps not uh, as far the AFS curriculum or AFS syllabus, but I, I felt I want to give you a bit of good start. So now some, one of you already said, uh, exponential is a good function, but do you like to disagree with your comment now or you still want to stick on that? Because we realize that a function may not be a good function if you cannot really evaluate, right? I mean, if you see from that point of view, yeah, people a different perspective. Someone may say the function is good if it is infinitely very differential. Well, uh, yes, I agree. I'm not talking, I'm not going to that direction. I'm just saying from computation perspective, do you want to change your mind that exponential is a very good function just after polynomial? Or you want to stick? You want to say that, no, I, I agree with what I said. <coughs> 
yes or no or confused 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 <laughs> makes sense what about others you guys also speak right so you have to speak you know you have to say something otherwise it's a very it's a virtual world i don't see you guys you know i don't feel the class that's a problem you seeing your face i can make up many things but i can't and so you have to you know say something you have to make some noise okay so indeed it is a bit of confusing and i think confusion at this point is the right word we are not very sure so let me uh, i don't know amber is around so amber says that we follow routine and as you know boss is always right so amber is right but in this case he is absolutely right so you know what routine starts with is the following statement exponential is the most important function in mathematics and if routine says something that's that makes sense okay so exponential is an really important function and this is a prologue in his book and i'm going to spend one hour so today half an uh, half or oh, 30 minutes tomorrow another 30 minutes i'm going to stress on this part to justify indeed uh, this is uh, really worth uh, looking at exponential function even the details what i will talk about may not have a direct connection with measure theory right away unless you start mixing complex analysis measure theory which is there but may not be in this course but try to for try to follow this uh, maybe it will be worth it okay so to talk about this statement i will do some power sets yes as i said even if it is not directly related with measure theory but let's go along with power sets before i talk about uh, how many of you don't know power sets Ah, oh, because this is virtual. Everybody knows everything, right? <laughs> power series, or how many of you have the courage to say, "I, I know power series, but I don't know what the heck is going on there. What is really, you know, what is the deeper meaning of power series? Why one should do power series?" Oh, I have just read definition. Ah, it's nice of you. See, you have to, you have to know you don't, know. and that's a very big thing. I, uh, I really appreciate. Anyone else? Okay, you are not going to ask me. Okay, you are not going to say this. Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. But uh, let's do this. And since uh, you have time uh, tonight, you are going to look at it. Uh, any one of your favorite book um, and have a good understanding. It's a, one of the most remarkable part of analysis. And some people, I do not know, uh, they don't get this idea. Okay, it's not good. And I'll go very fast. And uh, but uh, it should be convincing. To you. So before power series, let me talk about series because power series no you need to know the series. Okay, so series. Okay, given a sequence of fine uh, from complex, you can do as is with real, no problem. But complex is fine for us. <coughs> Consider the formal sum sum of uh, alpha n n equals to zero to infinity and call it star. Oh, by the way, what is the meaning of formal sum? we do not address questions of convergence okay wonderful but then why why i write that why i write this song so he said we do not we do we not we are not talking about convergence but we write so the formal sum meaning is just that so you just write you don't ask the question for instance if you write n equals to 0 to 5 alpha n you know the fell right because you know how to add five terms if you give me billion trillion or zillion or whatever terms uh, you know sum i can do that but when you say infinity who who can count up to infinity there is no point so it's just a formal that's the meaning of formals you no question asked so you just take it and either take it or leave it like that okay no question asked so you write the sum and forget it okay <clears throat> so that's the meaning of formal sum so this may not have any value yet at all and we have to make sense of the value how we do that well the standard thing look at the partial sum is n now this is very familiar to you sure so k from 0 to n alpha k that's what we call nth partial sum of the series star the series okay there is no value yet attached to it okay we say that star is summable with sum alpha scalar if this sequence partial sums uh, converge to alpha 
So if SN converts to alpha, then you say, all right, it is summable and the sum, the value of the series is alpha. Now formal tan goes, disappears. And if there is no alpha, then you say the series doesn't convert. There is, there is no meaning of this sum, right? If there is no alpha, if SN doesn't convert, then you say there is no meaning of it. Of course, there are finer meaning. You know, it may be converging to infinity, diverges to these, that, what not. Those are different, but you're not going to get a real number and the issue is over. Okay. You now, what is the meaning of when we write SN equals to alpha, the limit of this? That means your standard epsilon definite, a delta definite, not delta n definition. Epsilon positive given, there is a natural number n, which should depend on in principle on epsilon, such that modulus of SN minus alpha is less than epsilon. So you look at, let's consider this as a real case. You look at the point alpha, you go epsilon left and epsilon right, Okay, uh, in the real case, not in the complex case. So we will do this very quickly. Since it's a first lecture, right? Uh, I can afford this alpha, you go alpha minus epsilon and you go alpha plus epsilon. And you expect all of this uh, SN to stay in this bound. Uh, finitely many you can forget, except that they will come close, okay? That's the meaning of uh, sequence uh, convergence of sequence, right? And we say, as you have seen, that sum of alpha n is alpha, or alpha sum of alpha n converges to alpha. This is how we say. So this is all about series. And very quickly, you realize if this series converges to alpha, that means if the partial sum converges to alpha, the sequence converges to alpha, then you can recover alpha n from the difference of the partial sum Sn minus Sn minus 1, right? It's very easy to see. And if this guy converts, then the second one will also converge, then alpha n will converge to zero because Sn converges to alpha, Sn minus one also will converge to alpha, then alpha n converges to, converges to zero. This says a series is convergent would imply the tail alpha n converges to zero. There is no other way, okay? The converse is not true. Of course, you know, think about an example quickly. So this is- Sigma yeah. one What's that? Sigma 1 by n. Sigma 1 by n, uh, alpha n, go, uh, in this case, alpha n is 1 over n, which goes to 0, and the series the series doesn't converge. You are right. Very good. Is there any converse? You can say that alpha n goes to 0 plus something, and then the series converge. Think about this question. So alpha n converges sigma, to 0. Huh? Sigma minus 1 raised to n 1 by n. No, that's fine. Example is uh, well accepted. You are right. Now I'm saying something else. I'm saying, so alpha n converges to zero would not imply al sum of alpha n converges, right? That's what you said. Your example, yes, sir. right? Yes. Now I'm saying the following. Suppose alpha n converges to zero. Can you have another condition, another assumption, which would tell you alpha n converges, sum of alpha n converges? So alpha, the tail converges to zero alone is not enough to guarantee the convergency of sum of alpha n. I'm, I'm saying, is there anything else you can think of? But the original sequence should be decreasing and alternating. Oh, wow. Yeah, you have uh, many, uh, many things. So think about all those questions, okay? So alpha n converges to zero and what else you can do? You can go other way, okay? The, the, so you have to say, Okay, alpha n converges to zero plus something would assure, and plus something would assure this. Just keep this in mind. Okay, it's a, good, it's a fun. All right, so here is another example. Here is an example, perhaps. Oh, this is another example, or maybe list of example, uh, one of, from the list of examples, because some of you already said this, a couple of examples. It is the following. For each z in the complex, so as I said, you can take z from r also. So this z could be x also. You look at n equals to zero to infinity z power n, which is the sum one plus z plus z squared, etc. For fixed z, you define this, okay? Now, if your z, absolute z is larger than or equals to one, then absolute z power n is also larger than or equals to one for all n. And then z power n cannot converge to zero. And I said it is y check this out. So if this is larger than equals to one, then this doesn't converge. And hence, from this observation, we can conclude that this sum does not converge, does not make sense, as long as mod z bigger than equals to one. It includes mod x also bigger than equals to one, x is real. Do you buy this? 
So if you want to talk about the geometric series, the geometric series, if modulus of x is larger than or equals to one or mod z bigger than or equals to one, it doesn't converge. Now let's look at mod z less than one case. And this is a school uh, computation. You can look at the partial sum Sn. It will have a nice formula, you know, something like r power n minus one over r minus or something like that. And you can go on and you can prove if this is the case, then Sn indeed converge to one over one minus c. It should be, you know, Sn also depends on c. And while do that, please check this. Uh, are you so make sure this comment, are you using that z power n goes to zero as mod z less than one? Okay, so make sure whether you are really using this or tail goes to zero or not, okay? Otherwise, uh, you have to go and inspect all this claim, good claim, and you have to see whether I'm right or wrong, okay? All right, so uh, if mod z less than one, then the partial sum will end up converging to one over one minus z for each z in c such that mod z less than one, don't forget that part. Therefore, sum of z power n is one over one minus z for all z in c, so as long as mod z less than one. You agree with the equality thing? And do you, do you can you follow this? Part as well for all z such that z comes from the open disk, right? By the way, you might think I'm going to talk about complex analysis, holomorphic, this, that. No, no, not at all. Well, maybe I, I'll drop a few things, but not really. Okay. So, do you agree with this equality? Yes, sir. All right. And if you go beyond one, it's going to collapse, right? Which one is going to collapse, by the way? So if absolute z is, let's say absolute z is larger than one, which one is going to collapse in this equality? Left-hand side or right-hand side? Left-hand side. Ah, what about right-hand side? Left-hand side will, will collapse because we just observed, right? You're right. Even mod z is larger than it equals to. What about the right-hand side? Man, right hand side is going to make sense. Right? So there is some something going on. What is going on? So it seems you are saying that's a remark for all z in c minus one, the right hand side is a function, it's a legitimate function, right? No doubt about it. This is a rational function. Z equals to one is the only trouble. It's all fine. Uh, but the left hand side is a problem. So what you are saying, one, this A, part A gives you the left hand equals to right hand, but right hand side is defined on C minus one, where left hand side makes sense for all Z less than one. So this equality when you talk about holds only for mod Z less than one. So you have to be careful. So when you get a power series, you perhaps do some work and you can figure out a function which we'll talk about very soon and you say equality, but when you do that, keep this in mind, that function can have a continuation beyond the validity of, uh, you know, wherever the fun the left-hand side is defined, okay? It could go, it would have many, you know, it's possible that you can have a continuation of to other larger domain or larger set, etc. but be careful when you say this equals to that. In this case, this for all z says that z less than mod z less than one is really very important. Okay. Any question? Any doubt? Yeah. No. Okay. If not, then I just throw another definition. Suppose uh, you have a sequence of for n, and we say it is absolutely convergent. In short, I'll write a c. I'll write a dot c. Okay, uh, it's absolutely convergent if the, the series of positive real number modulus of minus convergence, convergent. Okay, make sense? So alpha n is absolutely AC, AC if modulus of alpha n sum converges. Fine. A little homework that absolute convergence will always imply convergence. And I this I work this out. The converse doesn't hold and there are plenty and this is one example. Can I leave this to you for, you know, to work out this? It's done, essentially. Have a look because the proof will hint you when you do, you know, if you do functional analysis or something like that or some other space, convergency, absolute convergency, this will help, okay? So, 
the key point absolute convergent would imply simple convergent however convergent may not imply ac okay keep this in mind and here is a very favorite tool which you which you are very fond of right uh, so it's called root test the root test is the following it's about six series suppose i have given a series of complex numbers alpha n from 0 to infinity and you just set alpha as limb soup of you know in a fruit of modulus of alpha n i was told that uh, limb soup and limb field in full be taken care in the tutorial please do that and don't stress right now if you don't understand don't recall don't stress on it okay it will be done tomorrow and when it will be uh, tomorrow you please follow that and you will need that idea in simply in in the future lectures not only my lecture even other lectures also i'm pretty sure in any case you compute all this you know in a fruit of alpha n mod alpha n and you look at the limb so which is going to exist you don't know it may be one it may be zero it, it may be a real number including zero positive non negative real number it could be zero it could be infinity you don't know okay so depending on whatever you are going to conclude the following if your alpha is less than one then the series this guy converges absolutely stress that thing absolutely okay and if alpha is larger than 1 then the series will diverge it will not converge but it will diverge okay so the root test is this definite a question occurs what happens if alpha is 1 well that uh, you have to do case to case you know there are cases uh, you have to really look at the sequence uh, the series and you have to do case study so larger than 1 diverges slope smaller than 1 absolutely converges very important to you now i am all set to talk about power series and i have 13 minutes left 12 minutes left and i'll talk about power series to whatever extent is possible any question till there till this ah this is a homework need not be i do not know i may not be tutorial because this is nothing to do with this test doesn't have anything to do with the major theory have to be careful <laughs> uh, not at least not in the next few lectures but you never know but limb soup in uh, should be done from the tutorial all right so if you don't have any question now i come to power series remember i promised you i'll talk about power series and i promised you to talk about power series because i told you a quotation by rudin that exponential is the best function see someone said based one of the it doesn't say even one of the best functions he says the best function that's uh, that's a bit of statement okay that's a quite a bit of statement so uh, so we have to really honor his uh, statement and as i said if rudin says something it is said well said okay the definition of power series what is that uh, alpha n is a sequence of complex number z not is a fixed point in c you can by the way if you are not very comfortable with c Well, you should because you know, exponential. I'm going to talk about over complex, but uh, you can replace this by r. No problem. No problem for timing. And you do what? You write again a formal sum. Formal, you understand now, right? I'm not going to talk about any meaning of it. Who cares? I am just you know writing this. So alpha and z minus z not power n. Uh, stop for a moment and say instead of n from zero to infinity, if I say this is a sum from a you know zero to let's say hundred. If I say this or whatever you know some number that's or some number capital n uh, alpha n z minus z not raise n. Oh, will you have will be happy with this guy now? you should be happy right why because you can actually you don't have to say any more formal sum it is just a finite sum you can talk about the meaning of it you can evaluate you can tell me the value whichever z you wish and for uh, for which z this will make sense by the way this sum will make sense by the way for any z because it's after all it's a polynomial in z right so if you give me a polynomial i can talk about all the possible value of the polynomial at any point right but the trouble or the difference from this and the left hand and right hand side is the following is the infinite sum and it's a finite sum 
uh, and so we do not know the meaning of it in general. So to make sense of it, and to do that, that's the title we say we throw. So this infinite sum, the formal sum, is known as power series around Z naught with coefficient alpha. N. So Z naught is given, alpha n is given. All these are all given, and you just write the sum, call it power series, just like the series. So now. If you think this as power series, then certainly z power n sum from n to zero to infinity is also a power series centered at origin with coefficient alpha n is a constant one, right? The geometric series is also a power series. And this is a very, very key example, by the way, power series. Now, before moving on, I tell you the comparison test, which again, I think you, you are very well aware of. If you are not, have a look uh, in your favorite uh, analysis book, okay? Um, suppose you have a series alpha n and beta n, complex series, not a problem. And beta n is absolutely convergent. So this guy is absolutely convergent. And what it does, this beta n dominates the alpha n, the, the absolute alpha n, for all n, but finitely many. You know, when you talk about series sequence, finitely many, it really doesn't count. As you can see, you know, I all I need to take, you know, take care of the, the long distance thing, not uh, something finitely. I think it's not an issue, right? So finitely many, you can forget because you can separate that finitely thing out and then you look at the infinite part, right? So if this is true, then this weaker guy, I mean, the dominated guy will be also absolutely covered. Actually very easy proof. Please do this if you are not very sure about it. I hope this will give you a chance to rec recall all the basic analysis thing. Okay, that's another reason. So more, I hope you don't mind doing all this. All right, uh, second thing. Uh, second thing is, uh, is, is the key why I'm telling one. That will be clear in part two and understand this part carefully. So if you agree with comparison test, now you do what? You take a power series centered at origin. You know, you can always take power series centered at origin because you can trust it. You can forget Z0, you can consider Z0 to be Z. Please do that. So you take a power series and you know what happens? Suppose there is a point Z0 in the complex plane for which this series is absolutely convergent. Okay. Suppose this series is absolutely convergent at Z0 equals to C. By that, what do I mean? By that, I mean that uh, sum of alpha n mod z raise n is finite, it's soluble. Suppose this is true. Okay. If this is the case, then by comparison test, you can straight away tell me for all z, whenever mod z is less than equals to z naught, this series will also absolutely converge at the point z. Do you understand this thing? Do you understand now uh, this point too? One more time, if you figure out one point Z0 in the complex plane or the real line, if you are in the real case, uh, such that the power series is absolutely convergent at the point Z0, absolutely convergent, okay? Then by comparison test, any Z modulus less than equals to Z0, the series will be absolutely convergent by convert comparison test, right? Now, this is very strong comment. Do you agree with me? Why it is strong? Let's say in the real case, because I do not have a Maybe I can, yeah, maybe I can work here. So suppose this is your origin, and suppose you, you find, found a point x naught for which the series is absolutely converging. Then what are you going to say? Then you're going to say all the point from 0 to x naught, and also all the point from 0 to minus x naught. This series will be absolutely converging. So you will find a region where the series is going to converge, is it not? That's a lot. That means what? You need to push this x naught as long as you, as much as you can to the right or to the left or whatever, right? So you need to expand your choice of x naught and you want to see where it stops, correct? And that's precisely done by the popular theorem, what you use, I guess, known as Hadamard theorem. What this says, I think this has a different name also. Hadamard is all I know. 
don't worry about the name it may be something else so given a power series a n z power n again i'm taking the center as zero you don't have to you can take z not translate everything accordingly and compute 1 over r lip soup of the nth root of modulus of a n which you can under the assumption the value might be you know 1 over 0 then you consider infinity the value could be 1 over infinity then you consider that to be zero so these are the standing assumption okay so you do that then for all z in the disk of radius r centered at origin that's the definition the power series is going to converge absolutely number one number two if you go beyond uh, this closure of the disk the power series will diverge right and the hope the proof i leave it as homework not for tutorial maybe because eh, this is a very standard thing it's a very simple at least it should be simple today if you look at it i promise okay it it, it is a simple uh, just you have to play with the definition of r and the comparison test so comparison test and the definition of r if you play with you'll figure this out very quickly here is a remark about uniform convergency i'm not going to recall it i'm skip i let me skip it uh, you can have a look by yourself. But I like to draw the picture. All in all, this is the following. So you have a power series, a n z minus z naught raise n, and then you quickly compute r as 1 over lim soup of the nth root of modulus of a n. You come up with a number. And suppose you, by chance your r is positive, there is a possibility that r is 0. You know some example. Let's say r is positive. Yeah, r equals to zero also makes sense in this scenario, but let's say r is positive. Then what is going to happen? You are going to look at the ball of radius r. Look at it. So this is your z naught, and this is the uh, disk of radius r. I do not know why it stops here. It should go there, right? It should go all the way to the boundary. Okay. And then you say the following, inside this disk of radius r, the series converges absolutely, perfectly. Outside the boundary, okay, the series diverges. Absolutely clear picture. So this is what I wanted to stress, okay? Absolute convergent, interior, divergent, uh, outside of the boundary. On the boundary, nobody knows what is going on. That you have to do physically, you have to check physically, okay, on the boundary. And if you take a slightly smaller disk, the closure, if it fits inside of the open disk of radius R, then the series is going to be uniformly convergent. I request you to have the notion of uniform convergence here, which I explained, proof also, have a look. I'm going to share this slide, uh, have a look uh, tonight, and uh, you, can, you can then completely understand what is really going on. And this is all about power series. Trust me. Oh, well, there are a few more things. Of course, there are a lot of things, but uh, the basic idea of power series. By the way, if you if your limit of a n plus one over a n this exists, then this limb soup formula is going to be equal to that. And perhaps that's what you compute most of it, most of the time. Okay. So the idea is I have one minute, perhaps. So given a power series a n z n we can talk about a legitimate function. That means you can really talk about a function because if it converges, you can talk about the value and that value you call it f of z. So what is f of z? f of z is the value of the power series at the point z, okay? So you can talk about a legitimate function defined from br0 to c. You do not want to talk about on the boundary. Okay? It's a delicate part, okay? You do not know what is going on on the boundary. I didn't say anything about neither the root test or all those things tells you, okay? So you are going to end up saying a function if defined on the region of convergence, this is known as region of convergence, okay? With, and this is the radius of convergence. This is going to be equals to this power series. And you must compare now this with one over one minus z equals to sum of z power n. And that's, uh, that's all about uh, it. Now I'm at 4.30, I take one more minute because I want to introduce exponential. Any question, by the way, up to this level? Am I talking too fast? Perhaps uh, because these are very basic. <laughs> but don't, uh, 
don't think I'm, <laughs> I should do first because basic, but I you know, have to cover the certain things, uh, what has been assigned to me. So, any question? No? No, it is clear. It's, it's good. Then it's good. Uh, the example. The example, my friend, what you said a few minutes back, consider the power series Z power n over n factorial. And as I said, this Lim soup formula becomes simpler if you can prove that Lim of mod a n plus one over n exists. So you compute mod a n plus one over a n. In this case, it is very easy. n plus one factorial over n factorial, that is n plus one. And then n plus one n goes to infinity is infinity, right? If it is infinity, then the radius of convergence is all over C, right? And then it tells you this power series is defined all over C. So it is absolutely convergent for any Z. It is also uniformly convergent on any compact subsets of C, right? And that's the definition of exponential function. Exponential function E power Z, sum of Z power N over N factorial for all Z in C. This is just a notation, you know, left hand side should be in principle f of z, but we need to respect Euler uh, for that e. Uh, Euler started saying e, however, uh, for us, he didn't mean for you know, his name. There were many value of e those days, I think, that came up. Gauss is another guy who is responsible for exponential. Anyway, so this is the definition. And as I said, e power z is just a notation. It is a function of z. So if you are not very sure, you can write f of z. But after a day or two, you should go back to e power z. And that's where I stop. Any question? Yeah, so can we stop recording, sir? Sure. Yeah.